Mr. Gove. I see what you did there. I'm not sure if the scamps do exactly just yet, but I promise you, very shortly, they shall. I was planning on talking to you about education in the UK when our current education secretary, one Michael Gove, stuck his head above the parapet, as it were, and lobbed a hand grenade amongst the carrier pigeons, as I've no doubt you are perfectly aware, his piece in the Daily Mail. You can find it on the net. I encourage you to read it. It won't take long. Indeed, for an attempt to overthrow decades of consensus in history, it's stunningly brief. But let us afford every latitude to Mr. Gove. He has said that these matters should be debated. And certainly it would be as well that we took a moment to remind ourselves of those dark times and any lessons they may have for us. So, let's examine what he has to say. His opening comments in the mail piece are overtly political rhetoric upon his education strategy thus far, but we want to concentrate on his World War I comments, don't we? For now. But we shall return to those opening remarks once we've examined his views upon World War I, and then shall see how his political rhetoric illuminates his revisionism. As the world and his wife are now well aware, the essential thrust of the piece is that the commonly held view of an establishment that sent millions to stand up and be mown down in an exercise of crass inhuman futility is a gross perversion of the facts and just plain wrong. And indeed, more than that, it's a left-wing conspiracy. Hmm. Well... Let's start with a beginner's class in what the study of history in fact is. Obviously, you begin with an assembling of relevant facts. For instance, kickoff was announced by the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the 28th of July 1914, and the final whistle blew on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918. It has been said that the assassination of Franz Ferdinand sparked matters, but a number of historians have chosen to see that as little more than an excuse to get down to business. And already, we have hit the slippery matter of perspective. Some people view the assassination as pivotal, some view it as almost incidental, because there are facts that you can pin down with no trouble, but it's remarkable how little those facts actually tell you. Human dealings are more subtle than that. Perspective. That is crucial to how you understand a matter. To illustrate what I mean, let's look at the far less contentious matter of World War II. There are incidents within that conflict that people argue back and forth, but as a whole it has to be one of the very simplest of wars to understand. The triumph of the Nazis would have meant the end of civilization. The Nazis burned people as readily as they burned books, anti-intellectual, totalitarian and ideologically murderous. They did damage enough while they could, but left unchecked their rampage of killing and their destruction of culture, their abuse of science and rewriting of history would have ushered in a dark age to rival the fall of Rome. As World War I claimed the lives of good men, so did World War II, left children without fathers. The tragedies of war aren't just on the level of competing nations. They're domestic, too. So, let us consider truth and perspective. For instance, you'll all be aware of Pink Floyd's The Wall, Roger Waters' meditation upon alienation, the result of growing up fatherless because of the Second World War. In the film version of The Wall, and then also in the next album, The Final Cut, regarded by many as an appendix to The Wall, there is a track titled When the Tigers Broke Free. It's about the death of his father, Eric, in action during Operation Shingle, the Italian landings in 44 that heralded the Allies taking back Europe and, eventually, winning the war and defeating Nazism. The last lyric is, And that's how the High Command took my daddy from me. Now, that's a perfectly valid, if intensely personal, perspective. The fact that it's a valid and personal perspective doesn't mean that we shouldn't have fought Hitler because it's also a valid perspective that the sacrifices of Anzio played a significant role in defeating the greatest evil to have walked this globe. We don't need to choose one or the other as the truth. They're both valid. They both possess some truth. One does not negate the other. The fact that the child's loss and the grown man's anger at his loss does not provide for a sound basis for public policy, military strategy, and grand historical overview does not invalidate the child's sense of loss or the man's anger. The world isn't as childishly simple as that. It's a matter of perspective, deciding which perspective is to be applied most fruitfully in which context. Any attempt to just trump death of a father with defeating the Nazis is dishonest, gratuitous, and insulting. And so to Mr. Gove, he says... <laughs> 
Generals who were excoriated for their bloody folly have now, after proper study, been reassessed. Douglas Haig, held up as a crude butcher, has been seen in a new light thanks to Professor Gary Sheffield of Wolverhampton University, who depicts him as a patriotic leader grappling with the new complexities of industrial warfare. So, because Haig was a patriotic leader grappling honestly with the new complexities of industrial warfare, he therefore could not be a crude butcher. Uh, but of course, he could. The one doesn't cancel out the other, and certainly the one provides no excuse for the other. If this is an attempt to argue the exoneration of Haig, I'm afraid we should not award it a very high mark. Just because the generals didn't have a better idea than line them up to be shot at, doesn't make line them up to be shot at a good or moral idea. The two truths of generals honestly out of their depth with the new realities of industrial warfare, and generals who therefore send their men to be butchered, may coexist. Which of the two you choose to give precedence to is a matter of perspective. You'll note I haven't challenged the patriotic leader bit. Do you think I ought? Then I ask you, what does patriotic mean? Which brings us to the next important aspect of the study of history, interpretation. First you have facts which are mediated through perspective and then interpreted. Patriotism is not a fact, is it? It can mean different things to different people. To some it may mean my country, right or wrong, and to some it may mean otherwise. Some may invest their patriotism in the person of the monarch, and some in the glories of the culture of Shakespeare, uh, the Beatles, and uh, schoolboys with jumpers for goalposts, etc., etc. When Mr. Gove posits Haig as a patriotic leader, we must look closer at what Mr. Gove might mean by patriotism. There are clues in the Mail article. For instance, he says... It is important to recognise that many of the new analyses emerging challenge existing left-wing versions of the past, designed to belittle Britain and its leaders. So, the left-wing versions of history are designed to belittle Britain and its leaders. I assume it would be an uncontentious assertion on my part to propose that any effort to belittle Britain, per se, would be, by definition, unpatriotic. Yes? But you'll note that Mr. Gove here ties Britain and its leaders together. The necessary implication would be that to belittle Britain's leaders would be unpatriotic. To support them would therefore be patriotic. To attack one of the two elements, Britain or its leaders, is to attack the other. But that doesn't make sense because we change our leaders and Britain accommodates that change. They are clearly not the same thing. Britain includes our leaders, but isn't embodied by them. That's sort of the whole point of having a head of state distinct from the executive. Indeed, the inclusion of the word Britain in the phrase designed to belittle Britain and its leaders is a thoroughly disingenuous attempt to uh, <clears throat> borrow the authority of and loyalty to Britain and invest it in its leaders. So much for Mr. Gove's use of patriotism. Now let's turn to his use of the phrase left wing. Criticism of the war begins during the war and is led by the war poets who are often of the officer class. Siegfried Sassoon, for instance, who, prior to the war, led a low-key and apparently largely a political life as a country gentleman, but in the course of the war indicted the running of the war in a way that might have had him shot as a coward had his evident courage thus far not won him the military cross. He came out of that war a campaigner for labour. Commentators since include Niall Ferguson, who, in his book The Pity of War, damns the prosecution of the war, but is no lefty by any stretch of the imagination. Not to mention, Tory minister under Margaret Thatcher herself, Alan Clark, in his book, The Donkeys. I mean, lefty? I think not. After all, if a war was prosecuted badly, it isn't a matter of political leaning to object to it. Left or right, you've an interest in stopping incompetent generals, slaying your fellows and endangering the integrity of your country. So, Mr. Gove's assertion that criticism of how the war was prosecuted must indicate lefty leanings simply doesn't hold water. Note I said of the prosecution how the war was fought. Much may be said of why the war came about. Uh, Germany was certainly aggressive, led by a neurotic Kaiser, but I'll leave that alone here. 
The orthodoxy of criticism which Mr. Gove would counter is not about the eruption of war because there isn't a consensus on that point. The consensus that Mr. Gove opposes is about the prosecution of the war. And even Professor Gary Sheffield, whom Mr. Gove cites in support of the reappraisal of Haig, has since said that whilst they agree reappraisal of Haig is warranted, what he, that's Mr. Gove, was wrong about, however, is that there is a left-right split. There isn't. This is what one of the very few academics Mr. Gove can find to support his assertions regarding Haig says. Professor Sheffield says, yes, Haig is worthy of reappraisal, but contention over Haig isn't about left-right politics. So why does Mr. Gove insist it is? It's transparently dishonest. Yes, dishonest of Mr. Gove to suggest such. I've talked of interpretation, but the suggestion that criticism of the way the war was prosecuted amounts to a lefty conspiracy is not a matter of interpretation. It's a dishonest assertion. There is a strong tradition of historians of a right tendency criticising the prosecution of the war. So, to recap, Mr. Gove attempts to posit criticism of leaders as necessarily criticisms of nation, so that the criticism of leaders becomes unpatriotic. He also insists that such criticism must be left-wing, so being a lefty is in itself being unpatriotic. That's quite a convenient assertion for a member of an executive loaded with old Etonians of markedly right-wing leanings, is it not? And, am I mistaken, or is it innately and inevitably anti-democratic? He's effectively saying that to criticise him as a member of the executive is to be unpatriotic. The natural implication would be that to vote out a sitting government would be unpatriotic, which is also quite convenient. And he makes these charges of being unpatriotic just as we remember our war dead. For he goes on to say... Whatever each of us takes from these acts of remembrance and hours of debate, it is always worth remembering that the freedom to draw our own conclusions about this conflict is a direct consequence of the bravery of men and women who fought for and believed in Britain's special tradition of liberty. Here in Britain, we do indeed have a special tradition of liberty, as he puts it, habeas corpus and all that jazz. But it has developed very slowly over time. Remember, at the outbreak of World War I, women did not have the vote. German men, and yes, it is just the men, enjoyed universal suffrage. It is estimated that 40% of the British fighting in the trenches could not vote. Our special tradition of liberty was yet very much a work in progress in 1914. Indeed, I would argue that our liberal project was massively advanced in reaction to the illiberality of the prosecution of World War I. You recall I said his opening comments in the Daily Mail piece amounted to political rhetoric. Let's now examine those opening remarks. He says... The past has never had a better future because history is enjoying a renaissance in Britain. We've changed how schools are judged, and our new measure of academic success for schools and pupils, the English Baccalaureate, rewards those who study history at GCSE. And the changes we've made to the history curriculum have been welcomed by top academics as a way to give all children a proper, rounded understanding of our country's past and its place in the world. Well... First, you should be aware that the English Baccalaureate has been subject to pretty much universal criticism. In principle, it was initially lauded by many, but what the Department of Education eventually attempted to roll out has inspired what might be fairly described as horror among teachers, academics, historians, writers, well, and just about anyone who's read the curriculum. But... You cry? The changes made to the history curriculum have been welcomed by top academics as a way of giving all children a proper, rounded understanding of our country's past and its place in the world. Has it now? The facts are these. His education reforms have been described as neo-Victorian and educationally inappropriate. 
Academics have been lining up to criticise Mr. Gove's meddling with education. Indeed, 200 assorted academics, poets, artists, authors and diverse interested parties, including the likes of Carol Ann Duffy and Michael Rosen, signed a letter to the Times warning of the risks his reforms pose to children. If we limit ourselves here just to the topics of the four in Mr. Gove's Daily Mail piece, that is, history, Simon Sharma, who supported Gove's reforms as they were initially described, once seeing them in the flesh, addressed the Hay Festival describing Mr. Gove's reform of the history curriculum as a ridiculous shopping list that was insulting and offensive. He suggested his audience, tell Michael Gove what you think of it. Let him know. Top academics have, in fact been vociferously damning of his reforms. This is a fact. Possibly he can find some supporters, but the weight of opinion against him is surely too great to merely dismiss. So, again, he's being dishonest. And if he can find a top academic somewhere to cheer him on, there are literally, literally hundreds of respected leaders in their fields, including academia, warning the country of what he is doing to our children. Indeed, the head of admissions at Oxford has stated that Mr Gove's secondary school reforms will, and I quote, just wreck the English education system. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking... It can't possibly be that bad. Well, a little research will prove to you that I haven't made up anything at all. Put aside just half an hour and research this yourselves on the net. Please, if you have children, please do this. I should say, however, that Mr. Gove's dishonesty is by no means restricted to his education strategy. I suggest you look into his axing of a number of labour-initiated Building Schools for the Future projects. He had claimed that the programme had been abused, telling Parliament that one individual had made £1 million out of it in one year. It transpired that five advisers had, over four years, earned £700,000 between them. But... I hear you say... What can the man possibly have to gain from such a determined effort to undermine our children's understanding of the world? I'm so glad you asked. Our answer may be teased out of the same article we are discussing. Remember, Mr Gove has changed the curriculum... ...as a way to give all children a proper, rounded understanding of our country's past and its place in the world. Almost everyone contests that this curriculum gives anything like a proper understanding. Quite the contrary, in fact. But he's keen that children are given the understanding he's pushing. That particular understanding. He then goes on to say... That understanding has never been needed more. Because the challenges we face today, great power rivalry, migrant populations on the move, rapid social upheaval growing global economic interdependence, massive technological change and fragile confidence in political elites are all challenges our forebears faced. Hmm. Whose forebears? His or yours? I mean, there are things on that their list of his which our great-grandparents had then to address and which we, too, must now address. But let's just take the last one on his list. Fragile confidence in political elites. He wishes somehow to address that. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, it, it's not a challenge for me, of course. I have no faith in our political elites because they've proven themselves to be self-serving and incompetent. My absence of confidence is a judgment based upon sound evidence and not a confusion. My, or may I venture to say, our lack of confidence is a challenge for him and his chums. Mind, it would be nice to have confidence in our political leaders, wouldn't it? So, is his remedy anything to do with the elites impressing us with their capabilities and competence in such a way as to justly build up our confidence in them? Nah. His remedy is to bend children to a state of mind and understanding more attuned to that prevalent in 1914 when the population as a whole did not believe itself fit to question, let alone criticise, their betters. A time when it was said that to question your leaders was to criticise and therefore betray your country. He continues. 
The government wants to give young people from every community the chance to learn about the heroism and sacrifice of our great-grandparents, which is why we are organising visits to the battlefields of the Western Front. Our children need to learn heroism and sacrifice because our times demand heroism and sacrifice. Well, they certainly demand sacrifice, we all get that. We have no confidence in the elites, however, because they are clearly dodging their share of that sacrifice. Ah, that's just whining. Have courage, like your great-grandparents. He wants to turn the clock back to an era of subservience and unquestioning respect for elites. Bankers want to rape the economy? Well, that is their right. They are your betters. In the early years of the 20th century, blood was sacrificed in the interests of czars, kaisers and kings, who were, of course, all cousins. Your vote, Grandmama. Now, now, boys, play nicely. Oh, very good, Grandmama. If you want to get into interpretations, it's perfectly possible to characterise the First World War as the fallout from a family feud. Now our economic health is to be sacrificed to the interests of the princes of our era, the corporate grandees. But we should bear up, as our great-grandparents did, accept it all as though there was nothing we could do about it. Ultimately, that's what this is all about. Mr. Gove wants children to know their place, and their place is subservient to the Eton Boy elite who currently sit in government, facilitating their mates in the city as they systematically rape the country of its wealth. Was Haig faced with a war unlike anything the world had previously seen? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Is it surprising that the generals and government blundered their way through it? No, no. Was it therefore moral that they did so? No. Is Blackadder comedy or history? Uh, comedy, comedy. Can it yet articulate through caricature a valid perspective? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Does that perspective amount to the whole truth? No, of course not. But is any of this really what Mr. Gove is concerned about? I think I've demonstrated Mr. Gove's essential dishonesty. And thus far, it's been pretty blatant. I'd like us to look at one more comment from the Daily Mail piece that struck me quite forcibly. It's a little more subtle than what we've looked at so far, but perhaps it's the most revealing. He graciously concedes. There is, of course, no unchallenged consensus. That is why it matters that we encourage an open debate on the war and its significance. Well, I've, I've met him halfway. Looked at his view as regards his central point that we are all subject to a left-wing conspiracy. I have to say it didn't withstand much scrutiny. But that's not what's important with this little nugget. What is he saying? He is saying that there are different viewpoints in history and they must be debated. Fair enough. Debating controversial viewpoints is the business of the study of history. But whilst he has found a few voices prepared to posit new perspectives on Haig he has not been able to find a single voice to back up his central thesis that we are subject to a left-wing conspiracy. Not one. Not one that I can find, anyway. But he insists we must debate the controversy. Do you see what I'm getting at? Where have you heard the phrase, debate the controversy? It's how creationists want to get creationism into science classes, isn't it? And that's a supremely dishonest and cynical strategy in itself, because there is no controversy as regards evolution. If you are a scientist, you respect the method. If you respect the method, you know that evolution is the best description for the development of life on Earth we have yet come up with. Some nutter shouting, Oh, no, it isn't! does not amount to a controversy. But... Teaching the controversy can grant a veneer of respectability to the palpably false and absurd. It can draw people, well-meaning people who are reasonably preoccupied with raising their kids and paying the mortgage and who have at the time at the end of the day to ponce off down to the cabin at the end of the garden in order to make overly long video diatribes. It can draw those people into mistakenly supposing that the daftest ideas have mm, some basis. <laughs> 
We need only remember the children who have died because of the spurious fears raised in relation to vaccinations to recognize that perception can sometimes triumph dangerously over fact. But can it really be that dangerous a situation? Can it? Did you know that Mr. Gove has approved three academies run by creationists? One of these schools at one point proudly declared it would teach creationism in the science class, although when it was pointed out that this was not allowed, it swiftly backtracked. The point is, they wanted to teach creationism as science. The other two do not teach it in science, but do teach it in RE. They teach the controversy, when there is no such controversy. But in doing so, they make their propaganda appear to be as respectable as science to young, malleable minds. The strategy is to put things into the classroom that are not subject to the intellectual rigour we should expect of true education. Because intellectual rigour promotes clear thinking, clear thinking promotes understanding, and understanding provides for a bullshit filter our political at least would find most inconvenient. There is a challenge for Mr Gove and his ilk. That challenge is to get us to put up with the status quo. It was relatively easy a hundred years ago, when education for most was comparatively rudimentary and the tradition of deference was secure. Now us lot of Herberts have like red loads and can communicate with the rest of the world. And so we're inclined to smell somewhat fishy when we have bankers who take profits when there are profits, but have us pay out when their fictional assets evaporate, and then wring a profit from that bailout. We're inclined to be struck by the oddity of utilities and services such as water, energy and the rail network that pay out to shareholders whilst providing dreadful service and in some cases whilst we the taxpayers still subsidise them. Of course, I know the, the piece of rubbish most of you lot fall for is that this is just how global capitalism works. And it isn't. Don't blame capitalism. This isn't capitalism. Ventured capital takes profit from success and goes to the wall for failure and does not run indefinitely off state subsidy. But this is far too great a topic to go into any further for now. But it will, I promise, form the basis for another presentation I plan to make you at some point in the future. I promise you my scamps. The lack of confidence in elites is Mr. Gove's challenge. It isn't ours. Our challenge is to maintain what our grandparents won as a result of two world wars. And we should remember that, just as many regular Tommies came back less deferential, now committed to finding new ways of living, so many of the elite came back determined to spread the fruits of civilization more evenly, where all the great-grandchildren of the generation that went to the trenches. And the lesson most of the survivors of whatever rank took from the trenches was that there's very little difference between men when they live in mud and squalor and spend their days playing the hot lead lottery. But for Mr Gove, there is plenty of difference. He hankers after an age where an elite was given free reign, where loyalty was owed, not earned, and where little people weren't so tiresome and uppity and a gentleman born to privilege was left to enjoy it, whilst said little people got on with, well, whatever it is little people do. Who cares as long as they're quiet about it? You see... The thing is, the generals may have been, by the terms of their status, chaps who meant well, but in the ranking of their priorities, matters of patriotism and the preservation of a social order that afforded them certain advantages was more important than the lives, the very lives, of the guys who ploughed their fields and baked their bread. What mattered to them was history, honour, respect, and the preeminence of their country and what they thought it stood for. Wellington is reputed to have declared that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. What he actually said, whilst watching the boys play a cricket match, was, There grows the stuff that won Waterloo. On the playing fields of Eton, young boys were taught to stand while a very hard ball was thrown right at them. Cricket is a gentleman's ritualised, abstract training in how to behave when facing cannon. That's what it's for. You play the game. You take your turn playing hot lead lottery to protect your and your family's privileges. It has been pointed out by various commentators that the proportion of the losses in the officer class was higher than that amongst the Tommies, as though this justifies the slaughter of the regular men. But the First World War was the officer class's fight. This was the privileged classes of nations squaring up to each other to maintain their privileges. The degree to which Britain... The United Kingdom, the island nation, was itself threatened, is highly debatable. The integrity of the empire was certainly threatened, and of course there were benefits for all as a result of empire. 
But did the crumbs that trickled down from the high table warrant the Tommies' sacrifice? What interest had the Tommies in maintaining that particular conception of Britain? Of course there is room for reappraisal of General Haig if the black-added caricature looms too large in the public consciousness. But I would remind you that for caricature to work, it cannot be a lie. It's selective exaggeration. So don't dismiss the black adder perspective. And don't allow any reappraisal of Haig to exonerate him and his ilk of their responsibility for lining men up to have their chests torn apart so that they could spend hours or maybe even days dying in the mud and even, and this did happen, be buried alive by their own side because there were just too many of them to deal with when all they ever wanted was to go home and see their mothers again and marry their sweethearts. The regular soldiers of World War II died to defend their homes, their mothers, their sweethearts, from subjugation by the Nazis, the cruelest bastards of modern history. The regular soldiers of World War I died to preserve a social order that maintained an elite sphere from which they were themselves determinedly excluded. Perspective is everything. What do you think is most important here? Is it leading a long, fulfilled life with children and a shot at happiness? Or is it maintaining a gentleman, an aristocrat, a king, or the modern-day equivalent in a privileged position? Which of those perspectives is most important to you? And don't get me wrong, I'm not a pacifist. The Second World War was a war that had to be fought if any of us would have a stab at a decent life. But don't you let anyone tell you that's what the First World War was about. The final insult. All that death and horror has, after a hundred years, become merely the means to an end. A particular perspective has been created of left-wing conspiracy, one that can't be substantiated but which is going to be pushed because it facilitates a certain interpretation of history, which in turn appears to vindicate an established order, all by an essentially unprincipled, demonstrably dishonest, extremely ignorant and cynical, self-serving little man. <laughs> Who happens to be in charge of your child's school.